welcome, welcome, welcome to Health Issues. I'm your host, Chris Sylvain, and we are thoroughly excited about today. Uh, believe me, uh, we have a great guest on, and uh, believe me, the whole city knows her well. I, I truly believe that. Uh, she is a Attorney Tracy Washington. Welcome. How are you today? I'm doing well. Thank you, and thank you for having me on the show. Well, we are honored, really. We've been uh, watching through the through the years, really making an impact, uh, a, a positive way on our city. We're here to actually talk about schools and violence in schools, and I, I can't think of anybody uh, better that can address this uh, from the community standpoint. Um, but before we do that, tell us a little bit about kind of um, wait, kind of take a student's career real quick, just a quick snapshot through it. Well, most people know me for my post-Katrina, and it's interesting how we measure our lives, right, in New Orleans, pre-Katrina and post-Katrina. Right. Um, so I've been practicing law for about 27 years, however, um, mostly labor and employment and school law okay. um, prior to Hurricane Katrina. Um, for a while, I served as the general counsel for the New Orleans public schools. And so I've been representing schools and school leaders, educators, uh, for almost all of my career. Um, right after Hurricane Katrina, uh, I worked for and I opened the NAACP's Gulf Coast Advocacy Center here in New Orleans, and we did um, a lot of um, work, really individual work, helping um, survivors of Katrina on individual issues, be it housing, education, and then um, larger social justice issues surrounding African Americans and their return to New Orleans. Part of that was education advocacy. And then after the NAACP's office closed, we opened uh, the Louisiana Justice Institute, myself, another attorney, Deep Jupiter, and Jacques Moriel. And we worked on a lot of social justice and civil rights issues surrounding health and hospitals, the litigation to reopen charity and public housing issues, and of course, education advocacy, because we had huge issues around the reopening of schools, school governance, special education, and all of those issues. And so as the product of two educators, schools have been prominent in my life, all of my life. <laughs> That's amazing. We were talking earlier about we're both in a Hyatt Hotel and how yes. Katrina has so much, so much uh, defined uh, life forever. I think. Oh my goodness, yeah. You know, the knuckleheads who chose to stay. <laughs> yeah, we did. <laughs> we just did. Um, we died in the wool with this. And so this issue and the school violence issue is, you know, it's, it's pretty near and dear to my heart, but also to the community. Well, I'm just thinking where it started was we happened to meet with some uh, young people. It was actually young men. They wanted to kind of meet with us and just kind of talk about issues. Um, uh, what dominated the conversation for these young men um, was school violence. Yes. It trumped grades and uh, everything. It, what happens is, is that in, uh, whether they were able to work through it themselves and not. These were not scary guys. I mean, they could handle themselves very well. Uh, but the issue was um, it dominates the school system. And obviously not all schools, because schools where you can just throw people out, that's different. But it, it, it dominates their life whether they have to fight that day. And um, the thing we started looking at it is that, well, who's focusing on this? Sure. Uh, are, are the it seems as though the schools are like the prisons. Just throw them in there, and if they beat themselves up, that's on them. Who cares? Well, you know, I step back, you know, as a mother of a now adult 23-year-old male, and when I hear these stories, and, and you, Chris, talk about this, I think for a second, this perspective they must have from probably age five, maybe even earlier going forward, of today I might have to fight, and, and how that frames their entire lives, what that means when you walk out of your door presuming there's safety in your home and know between your front stairs and getting to school there may be violence that you're enveloped with in the streets. That place that normally children in our country should see as a safe haven this school, this, this a safe space, is now also a place where you can see so much violence. And from their eyes, 
what what else is there your being your existence is not education it is simply surviving the violence that may come to you during the day and so from my perspective as an education advocate i look at school violence as a part of community violence and you know how is it that we not just as educators or as advocates, but as an entire community, work to provide safe spaces for these young men. Uh, and but but looking at it, and I was thrown aback, and I, and I, and I, I will say that you know, and I've had teenagers and so forth, and and and, and I'll I'll say honestly, I, uh, maybe the kids that I've been around have been in schools where violence is not an issue. Sure. But I got my eyes were open that these kids are saying, hey, that's not our school. And what it makes me think is that maybe they're speaking from the majority. Maybe it's the minority in schools that, uh, that is, don't, won't have that level of violence. And so where's the data? Who's doing the surveys? Yes. You know what I mean? Are we quantifying this, even, let alone trying to solve it? Well, and, I, and, and in response to your questions, because that's all that I think about, sure, there are some organizations that do some surveys. But I don't know, and, and, and I posit that we won't cure um, just community violence or, you know, get ourselves to this situation where we're feeling safe in the community because all we hear about in the news is, you know, putting more police out on the streets and, and dealing with the fact that in New Orleans, we have the highest rate of incarceration in the state and in the country, meaning in the world. All of that, you know, stems from us not dealing with the causes of the violence in the first place. Um, and then the next question is, when we get the data, Chris, what do we do with it, right? What do we do with the data once we get it? Um, and I don't know that I have the answer to that, but what I do feel from my perspective as a civil rights attorney, we have to address the, the, the civil rights aspect of this in my perspective, which is we have too many haves and have nots in this community. Those children are entitled to this free and appropriate public education. And it should not be that because you're in one part of town, you don't get educated because you're dealing with violence or because you're at this charter school that has poor management, you are not educated because of the violence. Some folks, I think, need to be held accountable. I, and, and that's the point because again, hey, community violence, uh, you know, uh, say the mayor and the police chief and everybody else can make a million excuses. But in the school, once you walk into that door, that, uh, that these kids have a right to be educated, then at that point, to me, the school board should be held accountable, the principal should be held accountable, and the answer shouldn't be locking the kids up and sending them to jail. And that's increasing the school to prison pop pipeline, and, and, and it's not that deep. I mean, we got social workers, and we can bring in people. There's a whole lot of army of people that can go in, but we're having a grading system based upon test scores and ACT when the kids are saying, wait, Am I safe or not? That's not the grades we need to be published on the one app gadget. Mm -hmm. You know, let's say, let's get that survey to say, well, these kids, 85% of the kids feel safe at this school, and let's combine that with that grade issue, and then I think we'll get a true representation. Well, most certainly a representation of what that school environment is like. From their perspective, um, what is it that they would like to see in the schools? when you were speaking with these um, young students, did they offer you um, proposed solutions from their eyes? I'm always curious about hearing from their perspective versus me, or you for that matter, just presuming this is what should happen. Like, you know, many people would say, okay, well, we put more guards in schools. Right. Is that what they want? No, and, and, and we, we dealt with that. Not that they had a direct answer, but the feeling that the system has failed them mm -hmm. was pervasive. Okay. Okay. They they recognized right away that something was wrong with the adults, mm -hmm. and they looked at us because basically, if we as the adults in the community allow kids to be 
beat up, abused, ought to have to beat up others to keep from being beat up. You know what I mean? It, 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 whatever method they have to use to deal with it then, this is a societal failure and nobody should be able to sleep at night as long as we have kids going through this. So the answer obviously is, uh, uh, Basic, they didn't say it directly because out of respect and love, but what I heard was you and everybody else need to be in that school trying to make sure things are tight. Well, and, and there are schools that have, you know, tremendous successes with um, curbing violence um, or uh, quashing.